are all here today for the launch of the Centre for Safe Air and NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence. Access to clean air is under increasing pressure with environmental events like bushfires becoming more and more the norm rather than the exception. There's also new understandings of the role of, that indoor environments can play in air quality and health. Tackling these complex issues needs a comprehensive approach with expertise from many sectors, health, environment, engineering and planning to name a few. The Centre for Safe Air will do just that, providing a national, coordinated and collaborative research approach. I'd now like to introduce to you Faye Johnston, Professor of Public Health at Menzies and the Director of the Centre for Safe Air, to tell you more about the ambitions of this exciting new initiative. Thank you. Thank you. There is something we often take for granted and we actually go through 11,000 litres of it every day through our lungs. Um, we don't always think about it, but at times we can't help but think about it. And I'm thinking particularly here in Canberra three summers ago, it was the capital city with the worst air quality, the worst affected capital city throughout the black summer bushfires. And throughout Australia, our team showed more than 400 people died as a result of that smoke. Thousands more were made ill and sent to hospital. So extreme events, you know, we're looking down the barrel at a, a, another frightening bushfire season. We don't quite know what's ahead of us. And Black Summer, of course, was followed by COVID, waves of COVID, which again drew our attention more to indoor spaces and hazards from others and infections and other people around us. But there's lots of, lots of hazards. Um, and as awful as the extreme events like Black Summer were, it's actually not so intuitively obvious, but the biggest public health burden actually comes from the air we breathe every day with our 11,000 litres. It's a bit like the quality of the food we eat, but little bits of air pollution from sources, wood heaters, traffic, all these fluctuating levels have a big influence on our health, right from when we're born and before we're born, right through throughout our lives. It's a very important risk factor in amongst all the other risk factors for things like lung disease, heart disease, stroke, dementia. The list is actually ever increasing. Um, you know, the estimates in Australia at the moment are around three and a half thousand deaths each year due to particle air pollution. A lot of those are pre preventable with very, you know, small improvements in air quality, you know, reducing our average air quality by just 5% will probably save 350 lives a year, 1.5 billion in, in avoided mortality. Um, but unlike diet and exercise and the other risk factors um, for heart disease, it's actually really hard to choose the quality of the air that you breathe. Like you can eat a healthy diet except at parties and you can you take what you get with air. Um, you might get the odd extreme event, but it's actually the everyday experience. Um, so that's why public health policy is everything for air. It's really hard for an individual to manage it. And public health policy is actually quite hard. It's complicated because it's health, it's environment, it's urban planning, it's land management, all sorts of expertise is required. So really that's where our centre is here to help. We've got experts and researchers from all sorts of disciplines our mission is to help translate policy into practice, to do the research where there are research gaps. Tiny interventions for air are actually one of the best buys, one of the most, um, uh, what is it? Great return on investments for health, for society, for the environment that you can do. And this report that we're launching today, and you've all got a copy of, outlines the case, the 10 good reasons for investment in safer air in Australia. So that's for your enjoyment and perusal. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for allowing me to join you this evening. I am very, very pleased um, to be asked to come and address you this evening, uh, particularly as you embark upon uh, your, your, your first discussions and meetings. Uh, you know, we often associate air quality and pollution with cities other than our own. Busy cities, big cities, cities on the other side of the world. But it's not actually that many years ago, in 2019, when air quality was being discussed at kitchen tables uh, right across Australia. And the black summer bushfires not only impacted the communities that were on the front line, they also created thick layers of smoke that 
swept across many Australian towns and cities. And here in Canberra, you could barely see Parliament House through the haze on some days. And at that point, many of us hadn't heard of an N95 mask, but in Sydney, some people in our community were wearing them to protect themselves from the impact of those fires every day. And by January 2020, Melbourne's air was declared the worst in the world. A survey by the University of New South Wales found that 22% of respondents had experienced difficulty breathing during that event. So these bushfires were not just an issue that we needed to respond with from a disaster uh, response perspective. They were a public health issue and they were a climate change issue. And the Centre for Safe Air I think will have a unique perspective to bring to these challenges, which actually increasingly present in integrated ways. You all understand the link between air quality and climate change across at least two fronts. The release of greenhouse gases has impacted air quality around the world and climate change is causing weather events like bushfires and floods that can impact air quality in communities. And it makes addressing climate change core business, I think, for uh, the centre. And it's core business for us too as a government. And after 10 years, we are really uh, acting swiftly and with a determination to deal with it. So just as you are taking a multidisciplinary approach to addressing air pollution, we are working with experts, with industry, with communities and all levels of government to respond to a changing climate. And I just want to talk to you about two major projects that we're working on. Uh, the first is, of course, moving as quickly as we can uh, to set Australia's economy on a path towards decarbonisation. Since coming into government, we have legislated our emissions reduction targets, putting us on a track to reach net zero by 2050. We've passed amendments to the safeguard mechanism, which will uh, reduce 205 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions to 2030. And we're transforming the energy system by investing in large and small scale renewable energy. And I know that the Centre for Safe Air has a keen interest in electrification and in energy performance. Uh, it's an area where I have been asked to play a role within the government and I was very pleased that in this year's budget we committed $1.7 billion to improve energy performance in homes and in businesses, including $300 million for upgrades to social housing, partnering with states and territories. And I had a chance to go and visit um, a community housing facility in Brisbane shortly after the budget. Uh, this was a facility that was providing housing for uh, single men at risk of homelessness. And the tenants very generously agreed to sit down with me and have a talk about their experience because at that facility they had uh, been supported to make an investment, putting solar panels on the roof, uh, renovating the um, studio apartments that the men were living in, uh, including putting split cycle air conditioning into those homes. And it was incredible to hear those men tell that story about what those quite small adjustments to those homes had meant for them. So they told me that the air conditioning had made their flats more comfortable. They could now close the windows on a steamy summer night in Brisbane and shut out the sounds of the city because this facility was on a very, very busy road. They were sleeping better. Their mental health had improved because they were getting more sleep and because they were getting more sleep they were able to accept more hours when those hours were offered to them at the places that they were working. It was actually this lovely human story about a, how a small intervention was really changing their lives. They talked also about improvements to their weekly budget that many Australians would consider modest a reduction in costs from $12 a week to $8 a week in terms of the contribution they were making to the electricity costs in the facility. And they talked about what that meant for them when they went shopping to obtain food for themselves. This was a really powerful demonstration of how these kinds of investments and transformations can make a great deal of difference. And we know that we have technologies to support people um, as they uh, grapple with these changes. And the trick is 
linking people with both the technology and the finance to make the difference that is required. When our package is rolled out, tens of thousands of Australians facing disadvantage across the country will breathe a little easier and all of us will benefit as we step along that path to net zero. The key here is that we want as many Australians as possible to have access to these technologies to make the best choices for themselves and their families and that has to include people living on very low incomes. The second project I wanted to talk to you about was building our adaptive capacity. So even if we can pursue our path of rapid emissions reduction globally, there are still now some changes to the climate that are baked in and now cannot be avoided. And our economy, our environment, our infrastructure, our communities are going to need to take steps to adapt. Um, and I know that my colleague Jed Carney uh, will speak to you, I think, has not spoken to you yet, but will speak to you later in, the, in, in your meeting about the National Climate and Health Strategy. Uh, I managed to attend the first of the roundtables for that strategy with Minister Carney and the local MP, Dr Michelle Anandaraja, who's a very passionate advocate around these issues. And there were so many insights available to us from health professionals in that forum about that interaction between climate change and health, air quality and how the government can best work with the health sector uh, to address some of the anticipated impacts of a change in climate. But more broadly, we are investing uh, 27.4 million to develop our first national uh, climate risk assessment and a national adaptation plan. And so that risk assessment will see the Australian Climate Service draw together the data that we have uh, on the climate science itself, but with social and economic and uh, population data. And so for the first time, we'll have a national picture of the risks that we'll need to, to address together that can drive of public investment, of course, but also private sector investment and responses. Um, and the information collected through that risk assessment will form the basis for another first, which will be the first national adaptation plan. And that will establish a clear picture of our national priorities and support better decision making by communities, governments and business. That risk assessment will look at risks uh, to the health and social support system and the risks that the health and social support system will need to respond to. And so I make a sincere request to all of you to contribute to that work. It will continue to the end of next year and there will be opportunities where we're calling on you to, to provide your expertise. This is a big task. Decarbonising the Australian economy is a big task. Adapting the Australian economy and our society more generally to a changing climate is a big task. The centre's work will be invaluable as a, as a contributor to all of this. Um, there are many challenges, but we can, uh, we can succeed if we work on them together. Uh, and I really just want to conclude by congratulating you on your launch, wishing you the best this evening and for all of your discussions, uh, and thanking you again for having me this evening. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Senator the Honourable Jed Carney, MP, to address us in a pre-recorded speech. Well, good evening, and thank you, Professor Johnston, for the invitation to take part in this launch. Now, clean air is safe air. For too long, air was regarded as simply a free source. But today, we know it's essential for good health and well-being. We learned during the pandemic the importance of having clean air and protecting ourselves with masks and purifiers. And we know that increasingly there are airborne threats from weather and environmental factors like smoke, pollution and pollen. Being from Melbourne myself, I remember well the thunderstorm asthma threats that we've experienced in recent years. Air pollution is also a workplace issue. Having clean air at work means workers are safe at work. But we know that many are exposed to pollution, dangerous dusts, and for workers in healthcare, they're exposed to infectious diseases. Our government knows that everyone deserves to be able to breathe safe, clean air. And air quality is one of the key indicators linked to overall life satisfaction. We also know that pollution attributed to climate change is already increasing respiratory conditions such as asthma and lung cancer. And generally, Australia is one of the safest places in the world for safe air. But unexpected events can happen in the blink of an eye an infectious disease can require rapid response or a bushfire can cast smoke over millions of people. We can and must do better. 
I'm proud to be working with parliamentary colleagues, Minister Husig and Dr Michelle Ananda Raja on this very issue. I've asked Australia's Chief Scientist, Dr Cathy Foley, to commission a report from the National Science and Technology Council on best practice and opportunities to improve indoor air quality. I'm very much looking forward to receiving your advice and working with you on this important work. And I want to commend the University of Tasmania for your leadership in establishing the Centre for Safe Air. We cannot address these significant challenges in our society without collaboration and input from across sectors and industries, and of course, research. Research to increase our knowledge about air quality and health is essential to underpin good policy. I congratulate Professor Johnston and all of your research colleagues in the Centre of Research Excellence. I very much look forward to engaging with you in the future. I know much more is to come. Thank you. Guy's going to start us off tonight with some of your thoughts. Over to you, Guy. The concept of safe air is one that's sort of be become uh, emerged over the last few years. But it actually, for me, brings together a number of different themes that I've worked on over a long period of time. And, it, and, it, and when, you think, when I think about it, it's really, um, it's really very obvious. And I'm not sure why we have not talked about this before. Um, but we, we, and I think what has actually brought it to, our, to focus has been um, three major <laughs> challenges that have happened over the last few years. And we've heard about them all already this evening. Um, all of which had to do, all of which were airborne disasters that, 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 uh, that affected us. The first was actually the thunderstorm asthma epidemic, which Jed Carney referred to in Melbourne in 2016, where um, you know, havoc was brought by the air in the form of uh, very small particles of, of pollen allergen, which the large number of sensitised people in Melbourne were able to inhale in, under unusual circumstances. And it generated in those people a severe um, asthmatic reaction, a, a, a well, a, an event that's well characterised in, in physiology, the, the reaction that happens when people who are sensitised and have airway hyperresponsiveness inhale an allergen, they get a persistent, a severe and persistent airway inflammation and narrowing, which in many cases was life-threatening and in fact, in sadly in 10 cases, led to deaths. These events have happened before and will happen again. This was the most severe episode that's been reported anywhere in the world. But it opened our eyes to the fact that these people were doing nothing other than breathing the air in the environment that they were living in. And then the next was, uh, was of course, the black summer bushfires, which we've heard also several times about today. And suddenly, most of southeastern Australia was bathed in smoke uh, and uh, caused, uh, an, as, as, as Faye has reminded us, caused a number of deaths um, uh, uh, that would be attributable to it and a lot of ill health in the community. And, this was another example where the air that we take for granted suddenly was heavily polluted and causing severe problems. And this was, we'd only just recovered from that, in fact we hadn't recovered from it, uh, when we got COVID. Um, and COVID was the, the third airborne threat to health. It took a long time for many people to accept that it was an airborne threat to health. We got a lot of mis misleading advice, in fact, about how to control COVID. And people were talking about washing your hands and not touching, not touching the signs on the road, the, the, the buttons on, on to cross the road and all this sort of thing. But actually, it is an airborne threat to health. And it, it comes from people who spread the virus into the air and other people who inhale it. So those are the three sort of big big three that really brought this to the focus. But underlying that, we've been dealing with many major airborne threats to health for a long period of time. There is the outdoor the ambient air pollution, which we've been aware of for a long time from motor, from motor vehicles, from industry, from power stations. There are many indoor sources of adverse uh, air quality, such as uh, uh, various forms of combustion, 
heaters, whether it's wood or gas, both of which produce uh, uh, toxic substances in the indoor air. And then, so, so ambient air has been an important one. The other airborne threat that we've dealt with for a long time is actually, it, it is, is occupational asthma and occupational allergens. So the threat to people in the workplace from hazardous substances they're, that they're exposed to in their workplace is an airborne threat to health and can be controlled. Um, and so I think for the first time we've, we've sort of started to realise that many of the things that we take for granted, we take for granted the fact that uh, we can breathe air, but we also take for granted the fact, we've tended to take for granted the fact there's not much we can do about it. And we learned actually with COVID, actually there's plenty we can do about it. There are lots of things we can do about it and we need to take this seriously and start to think about what we can do about it. The way I've suggested and, and others I think have suggested this about how we should deal with this actually borrows from the model that's been used for many years for how we control occupational, exposure, occupational hazards. And that's to think about um, the, the source of the hazard the vehicle through which the hazard is, is passed, which in this case is the air, and the receptor, which is the person, the person who is at risk. So there are many sources of, of hazards that we could think about. In the case of COVID, it was other people with COVID. In the case of influenza, it's other people with influenza. In the case of tuberculosis, it's other people with tuberculosis. They are the source. Uh, but in case of uh, other air pollutants, it's, as I said, um, it might be bushfires, it might be um, vehicular transport, other combustion sources. So there's a diverse range of sources and the best way to control the hazards of unsafe air is to stop the emissions into the air, to stop them at their source. And wherever possible, that's what we need to try to do. Where it's not, and that worked with COVID, for example. We did stop the emissions of COVID into the air by identifying people with COVID and isolating them and putting them in quarantine. And at the time when we had to do that, it, it actually did work. It was a draconian method, but it, did act, it does actually work. If, you, if that doesn't work or it's not feasible, then the next is to actually do something about the air itself, to refresh the air frequently, because fortunately we have lots of air. <laughs> and if we refresh it frequently, we dilute the hazardous things that are in the air or to filter the air or in some other way to clean the air. So things that we can do to change the air will make the air less hazardous and we can do that. And the final and last resort <laughs> is to actually put, is actually to protect the, the receptor, the, pers the person in the community who is exposed to hazardous air. And that's really where, at the moment, respirators and masks, mainly respirators, uh, N95 masks, uh, are useful. But they are the last resort, and they only ne are needed if the first two resorts are not successful. So I think we need to think of this as a hierarchy of particular interventions that we can do, the best being trying to prevent emissions of hazardous substance into the air, the next best trying to clean the air, and the third best trying to protect people from, the, uh, from hazardous air. So I'm, I'm going to stop talking now, I've probably talked enough, but I just wanted to uh, sort of illustrate some of the thinking that we're doing and I hope some of the work that we'll be able to do through this centre. And finally I wanted to congratulate the team and particularly I want to congratulate Faye on the success in getting this grant, this CRE, and in, uh, and in leading it. And uh, I'm very pleased to see you in this role, Faye. <laughs>It's really lovely um, to join you um, today, and I, I'm really, um, I feel really honoured to um, to be um, to be invited here today. And I recognise that most of the people in the room are health experts and have been really working on this issue from a health perspective. And sort of recognise that I come to this issue from a slightly different perspective in terms of from an environment perspective. 
And so what I wanted to do tonight in the opening is just share with you a little bit about the work that we've been doing here in the ACT in terms of responding to the issue of air quality. And um, while there's been a lot of focus on some of the big events that have happened around air quality, whether it be Black Summer and, and the issues around COVID, um, that we have really been focused on looking at some of the lower, you know, lower um, acknowledged um, issues around air quality, but the really important ones. Um, uh, I'm a member of the ACT Greens and we've really been focused on this issue of how we really protect this pristine environment for many years and we went to the 2020 election um, talking about the right to a healthy environment. Um, we are a human rights jurisdiction and um, we thought that it was really important that we look at our Human Rights Act um, and introduce a new right, to a, which is a right to a healthy environment. This is work that is happening internationally but has not had a lot of traction here, um, here in Australia. And so over the last couple of years, we've been working really closely with colleagues across the Assembly. And I'm really excited that, to be working with the Minister for Human Rights, Tara Chain, and some other colleagues, such as my colleague, Joe Clay, um, to, um, to be working on introducing the right to a healthy environment um, by the end of this year. So this will be a jurisdictional first. So this will place really strong obligations on us as a government, on public institutions, on the whole community in terms of how we ensure uh, that we do have a healthy environment. And key to that is clean air. Um, so it will really um, make sure, mean that we need to respond to the issue of clean air. Um, as people have, have noted, um, the ACT was particularly badly affected by the Black Summer um, of tw uh, 2019 and 2020. And I remember the morning of, I think it was the 7th of January, where we woke up um, and could not even breathe in our own homes. We could not see outside our front our front steps and um, it, we never realised that in this, this community, the bush capital, with its beautiful natural environment, that we would be in a situation where we would not be able to breathe the air around us. And so I think it really did focus us as a community and um, there was commitments made, particularly around a, um, a, um, the development of a bushfire smoke and air quality strategy. Um, at that time, it was really focused on bushfire smoke. Uh, but when I took over the portfolio of environment, I realised there was an opportunity to respond to another key issue for many members in our community. And I would like to acknowledge I've seen a number of local advocates in, um, in the room who have been working for decades on the issue, particularly of wood fire, um, wood fire heaters, uh, wood fire smoke. And um, that is what I'd like to really... Um, really um, really tell you what we've been doing around this, this issue, that while it doesn't have the profile of a whole city choked in bushfire smoke, we know that there are community members whose health are being severely affected, in particular areas in our community because of topography, but also because of their own vulnerabilities. We've been... Um, We've been really focused, we had been focused on this and, and my vision is really that we have a suburban and urban Canberra where people live in comfortable, well insulated, well settled homes that are protected by clean, green electricity. We've committed to an electrification pathway and it was really clear to me that wood fire heaters do not fit as part of this vision. While we've been working hard on this issue for a number of years and supported by many advocates within this room, I would like to acknowledge a really important trigger for us to really bring this issue to the fore and respond to it. And that was the work of the Commissioner for Sustainability and the Environment, Dr. Sophie Lewis, who is here. He led an investigation into wood fire heater policy in the ACT. And I'd also like to acknowledge Faye, uh, Faye Johnson, who contributed to the important work of expert commentary on the impacts of health. 
So I think these two, the two issues of us committing to an electrification pathway, which included the transition out of gas and the really important work of, of, of Dr Lewis, really created the, you know, created the environment for us to have a really serious conversation about this issue and really work with our government partners in terms of working, you know, of really articulating the fact that wood fire heaters really had no part to play in this vision of what we were heading for our community. So this led to the announcement of a fortnight ago that the ACT government has now endorsed a position to phase out wood fire heaters in the ACT by 2045. So, It's a big step and I think sometimes the first step is the most important step. I recognise that 2045 seems a long way away, but this is really in terms of us um, integrating this work into the electrification pathway. There's a lot of work to be done because now we have to work on the plan for phasing out wood fire heaters in all suburbs, excluding rural areas, and to transition away from fossil fuel gas by 2045. But we've started the work already. I think that the gas transition has provided us with some really cl clear um, guidance in terms of what the pathway might look like. We're now looking and scoping the design of a regulatory impact assessment that will really help us understand the work that we need to do around business and community. I think we can really look at um, you know, some of the phases in terms of how we work with consumers to transition and I think the issue of low income households is a particularly important issue that we are already looking at. And we've already started the work. We already have suburbs, um, particularly in our newer areas, where wood fire heaters are, are already banned. So we have really started this, we have started this work. And we really want to work with community to ensure that they that this phase out is part of a just transition as we move to electrification. Because we are aware of the inequality crisis and the high cost of living, and we think that this is already, you know, this, this is already placing um, some um, pressures on families. We really feel like we need to look at this, um, you know, this, this key issue and how it's not only impacting on humans, but it really is impacting on our planetarian home. Bill McKibben presents a good rule of thumb to counter climate change. We just need to stop burning things. We also need to stop chopping down our forests, the homes of other critters and burning their homes. And I will, I think that it is really important to think about this whole issue around burning things when we look at the issue of climate change. It is fantastic to see a new government that is really understanding the importance of the climate challenge and the, the work that we need to do in terms of um, transitioning to a no um, emissions economy. But we do need to recognise some of the work that, it, that, some of the things that are still going on that are creating pollution and impacting on air quality and the health of our environment. Back in 2020, researchers estimated that coal power station pollution was causing almost 800 premature deaths in Australia. In the ACT, we've been powered, we've been 100% powered by renewable clean electricity since 2019. We need the, the federal government to catch up you know, and even you know, we've just seen the fourth new coal project, the Gregory coal mine in the Bowen Basin being approved, being approved last week to run to 2073. We need to stop this work. We need to stop making these kind of decisions. Clear, clear air is foundational to ensuring our communities are livable for all. While the ACT is displaying leadership, in the space of transitioning away from burning things and suffering the consequences, we really need other jurisdictions to join. We're really committed to supporting them and advocating for them to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the clean, cleaner capital of Australia. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a 
the, the place to be and, and the time to be here to, to launch uh, the Safer CRE. And uh, I, I, I would like to start by uh, congratulating Rebecca for the political courage to make this announcement a couple of weeks ago. I think it's, it's uh, historical, it's, it's important, and it's, uh, it's transformational. It's, uh, it's a step, it's a big step in the right direction. Uh, 2045 sounds like a long way, but it's a very important step, and, and, uh, and, and I'm sure things will uh, pick up momentum, and, and uh, Canberra can be the example nationwide for clean air and, and for making this change, making this important political commitment. Thank, thank you, Rebecca. I would like also to, to thank and congratulate uh, Sophie, Sophie Lewis. Uh, I think her report was uh, transformational. It made, made, made the big difference earlier this year. Uh, and it's a clear example of how science and evidence translated into policy and practice can make a difference. The translation, the, 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 the scientific evidence put into, uh, into policy and, and, uh, and, and motivating action uh, at, uh, at the practical level. So thank, thanks, Sophie, for the congratulations. Uh, I, I would like to acknowledge the many uh, people, colleagues, communities who've done an enormous amount of work uh, in, in Canberra and ACT to, uh, to make this uh, change happen. Uh, we have uh, representatives of the community here, Mari, Daryl, who've been campaigning for a very long time on these issues, much, much longer than I've been in this place. Uh, so Thank you for all the hard work, all the commitment, all the work that you have done for the community. And, and I know this is, not, this is not an easy campaign to, uh, to carry out, and, and it has been transformational. Thank, thank you very much, and, and congratulations to you. And, and, and of course, the, this, this place feels like a family reunion. You know, it's great to see so many. Uh, of their quality uh, colleagues, the community, uh, monitoring, modeling, coming from different parts of Australia. Um, I'm a relative newcomer, you know, I've been in Australia for four years, and, and, and I feel uh, part of this family. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to, to Faye uh, for her leadership and uh, for making this happen, the, the new CRE Safer. It's a fantastic opportunity for, for, for us, for everybody, for Australia, for communities. And, and also, I would like to thank uh, Guy for his leadership over, over the previous 10 years of, of the CAR CRE, which was uh, one of the, I think, of the best CREs I've, uh, I've come across and uh, I've been involved in in, uh, in, in previous years. So th th thank you both and thank every, everybody for the leadership you provided and the evidence and the good signs uh, that you brought uh, to, to air quality, air quality research. Thank you. I, should, I shouldn't forget that the, the, the organizations of big, big bodies were in the, in the room, ASMA Australia, Lang Foundation of Australia. Thank you for your leadership and advocacy. Fantastic work. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor and, and, and pleasure to be a part of, the, of, of your family as well. I have, I, have a, I have three pages of notes here, but I, I think, you know, it, I'm, I'm probably the last speaker. I'm going to start playing music at some stage. Okay. No, 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 you go for okay. it. Go for it. Can, can I be a bit um, personal in, yeah. in terms of the... So I would like to, to tell you some, some personal stories from my, from my experience. Um, I, I grew up in, um, in Athens, in Greece, and uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago, Airbus was very polluted. Athens was very polluted. I remember taking the bus to go to university, um, and um, in the background there was the Parthenon uh, of Acropolis, and uh, there were days that I couldn't see it, so the visibility was so affected by air pollution that I couldn't see the Parthenon in the background. And, and um, air pollution at that time in, in Athens was much heavier than it is now, and it came uh, largely from road traffic, polluting vehicles, industry power generation, it, it was, and, and diesel, uh, diesel heaters uh, in household, diesel, uh, for, uh, for heating, this diesel oil. Things, things have changed largely. Um, I remember the impact uh, of air pollution in respiratory health, you know, the allergies, the, the difficulty in breathing, uh, how that impacted uh, myself, my family, communities uh, living in that, in, that, in that environment. Years later, um, I moved to London um, 
worked and lived there for, for many years. My, my, my two children were born in London. Again, in a place which had a different issue with air pollution, like mainly traffic related, uh, natural dark side. I was uh, uh, over the limits, uh, uh, the guidelines for, for air quality, the limits for the protection of human health. I was working for Public Health England at that time, so we did a lot of campaigning, a lot of work, a lot of advocacy, a lot of uh, policy work around air quality in, in the UK and in, in England, 30,000 deaths every year attributable to air pollution. And at that time, also, you know, raising a young family, I thought, do, do I want my children to, uh, to grow up in, in a place which is heavily polluted uh, or polluted to a large extent? And, uh, and I thought, maybe, maybe not. At, at that time, uh, my, my manager at Public Health England, uh, director of Public Health, was uh, a never smoker diagnosed with lung cancer. Obviously, you know, as epidemiologists, we know that we cannot attribute a single case to a particular uh, source or particular uh, exposure, but it, it, was, it was a shocking, uh, uh, shocking finding, a shocking uh, thing to, to hear about a colleague. And, uh, and sometime later, um, there was a case of, of a young girl, uh, Ella, who lived in South London, who was uh, severely asthmatic, who passed away tragically, uh, year, 11 year old, uh, in one of these uh, asthma attacks. Uh, she lived close to a, a very heavily polluted uh, motorway, and um, after a, a number of doctors uh, advocated for, uh, for a change in the way this death was reported, she was, she was the first death which was ever uh, recorded as, uh, with the main cause of death as air pollution. And that was uh, a huge, uh, um, it had a huge impact in public opinion uh, and legislation in the UK with an introduction of a much uh, more stringent uh, legislation to control air pollution, the cleaner zones, et cetera, et cetera. But by that, by that time, uh, for a number of reasons, I moved uh, with my family to, to Canberra, to Australia, the cleaner capital of Australia. We thought much cleaner environment, and, and that was broadly the case, but four months later, we, it was the black summer. <laughs> I remember... Maybe you're the problem. Uh, I, I bring air pollution with me wherever I go. I remember sitting on the other side of, you know, walking on the si other side of the lake. I couldn't see the parliament on this side. Visibility was, uh, uh, you know, uh, terrible. Air pollution was the worst in the world uh, on that day. Um, obviously, this is not the case most of the time, but air pollution is a sticky problem. And, and as we realized here in, in Canberra and in other parts of Australia, we have air pollution in, in the summer, bushfires. We have air, air pollution in winter from uh, wood heaters. Um, prescribed burns. This time of the year, uh, pollen, the pollen season, uh, grass, grass pollen, allergies. So there are many sources of air pollution, and, and that's why it's a wicked problem. Uh, it's a difficult problem to address. It doesn't recognize boundaries. It is indoor, it's, it is outdoor. Uh, people live in leaky houses. It's very difficult to control. So we do need good science, and, and we need the expertise to uh, identify the best interventions, the best. Uh, measures to improve air quality, to reduce exposure, as, as, as Guy was saying, reduce exposure, reduce emissions at the source, reduce exposure in the environment, and reduce also personal exposure. So it is, it is something, obviously, that uh, we have, we've been making progress, and, and I think there, there's a lot of work, good work still to, to be done. A couple of things I would, I would like to, you know, going back to my notes, to, to mention is the issue of inequality. So, one, one important point about air pollution is that it doesn't affect everybody the same. So we are all exposed to air pollution, but it affects more heavily people who are either very young or very old, people who have pre-existing illness, people with asthma, people with other respiratory conditions, cardiovascular conditions, and also it affects more heavily people living in socioeconomically disadvantaged households. So by improving air quality, we actually act on inequities and inequalities in our society. And, and, and this is something we should remember. So it's one of the best, more effective ways to improve e equity, to improve health equity, environmental justice in our society, is by reducing air pollution. And, and, the, and the step of, of removing wood heaters, phasing out wood heaters, phasing out gas cookers in our, in our, in our households, it's uh, one of the most effective ways of doing that. And, and of course, the same applies to pollution coming from road traffic, power generation, industry, bushfires. The, 
the last point I would like to make is about climate change and air pollution, and, and, and there is an opportunity there. So if we address air pollution emissions of, of air pollutants, we largely address also greenhouse gas emissions. They, they largely come from the same sources, power generation, road traffic, bushfires, domestic sources, farming agriculture. So if we act decisively to reduce emissions of, of air pollutants, we also reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. So it's a win-win it's a for the environment, for human health, and for the economy, and, and for the society. So I, I would like to emphasize how important it is to uh, act on climate change as, as, as the director of the Hill Network, the Health Environments and Lives Network, uh, we're working very closely with, with the FAE, with the team here, to uh, identify and promote win-win uh, solutions for uh, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and, and uh, uh, air quality and human health. And, and we're heavily involved in the national uh, climate risk assessment and also in the development of the, of the national health and climate strategy, which is in progress, as we heard from the, from the ministers earlier. So I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Great to have you all in Canberra and, and enjoy the rest of the evening. You mentioned before that it's such a multifaceted issue, the clean air. It's a miracle that it's taken this long to, um, to get, to get a, a center up when it's such a pressing issue. With so many things all kind of rolled into the same topic, how do you make sure that the most pressing issues get dealt with when everything seems so important? Well, that's a good question and, and not one that I can give a straightforward answer to, unfortunately. Uh, I, I mean, I think uh, we have to... This is really a question for politicians. Politics is really about priorities and how you set, how you do one thing, how you set priorities. and. But I guess scientists can offer some, some assistance by identifying where are the, um, not, I don't like the term low hanging fruit because sometimes the high fruit are actually the important ones. But, the, but where is the best return on investment? So is what I really mean. So which are the big problems? So it has to be a big problem first. And secondly, it has to have a solution which is available to us to, to, to implement. Or well, we need to find a solution. Sometimes, the, sometimes it's a big problem, we don't have a solution, and the, the question is we need to try and find a solution and, and, and test it. So it really depends on what the circumstances are. I mean, COVID was a huge challenge to all sectors of society, uh, including the scientific community, uh, in in that it was something completely new. Uh, we, you know, on day one, we knew nothing about this. And we, but we had to do something about it on day two, okay? And so you had to, at the same time, take action, um, a, as well as try and work out what is the best actions to take. And, 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 and that, ha that actually, if you think back to that period, it was actually, I think, remarkably successful, particularly in this country. Uh, and some other countries as well, uh, that, that we did take um, broad uh, and with a fair bit of community support action to control COVID. Um, and, and we rapidly accumulated knowledge and adapted to that knowledge, uh, adapted our approach to that new knowledge in, an, in, in what I think was actually quite an effective um, effective response. My, you know, COVID was a disaster, but my, my overall response, my overall feeling about it is that the response was generally positive. Obviously, there were things that we could do better and we wish we had done better and it was not always great equity globally, but in many ways it was a positive, um, the nature of the response. But, you know, my, my general question is, I think, my general response to your question is we need to try and Look where there is opportunities for health gain, which is where there's a big problem and where there's a, an available solution. And then the other thing I would say is to sort of apply that hierarchical approach that I was discussing before and where possible, control adverse environmental hazards at their source, 
by preventing them from being released into the environment. That's, the f that, that's as I said, the first priority. That's not always possible. And when it's not possible, we try and clean the air in some way. And when that's finally, when that's not possible, we try and protect individuals with respirators. But, so that's the other sort of approach that I would sort of suggest that we take. Just following straight on to Rebecca, actually, because you mentioned politics, and it's great um, when there's uh, evidence-based things that are going to have a great return on investment, but if they're politically unpopular, then that's hard. And you've made some, a potentially you know, unpopular policy choice with, with going after wood-burning heaters, which is something that people have a real emotional attachment to often. Like, how do you navigate that when you're in the politics space? Yeah, look, I think um, look, it's a really, it's, it's a good question and I think there's um, no really good answer to this. <laughs> but I think it's about, I think there's a few elements that you need to come together. I think we need to be really clear and honest to, uh, to the community as elected officials that, you know, like I think it is really important that we are transparent in terms of the, the, the policies that we bring to the electorate and why we're bringing them to the electorate and actually really um, explaining 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 that. I think bringing the community with us is really important as well. I think that, you know, like there's been a little bit of discussion about the time frame around our announcement, but that is part of, you know, part of what we need to do is bring the community with us. It's about, you know, this, I, being involved in the, in, in the um, politics that I'm involved in, particularly as not one of the, not coming from one of the two major parties, I am really conscious that often this is about a journey and this is not about, you know, actually getting to the very end outcome straight away that we need to actually take steps to do that. That's becoming increasingly difficult with some of the challenges that we face and I think climate, the climate is a really good example of that. Um, and certainly the challenges that we have around biodiversity is that um, a stepped approach and a long-term approach is getting harder and harder when we have urgent, you know, like when we look at the urgency of the issues that we have in front of us. But I think there's also, you know, like I think one of the other interesting things around politics is that it's a bit about science, but it's a lot about art and it's a, quite a lot about luck as well. And in terms of actually recognising the moment when there's an you know, there is an alignment and you're actually able to bring numbers of things together, I think. Being in a small jurisdiction and having responsibility for lots of different issues, I'm always struck with the interconnectedness of issues um, that I deal with, you know, looking at something like, you know, environment, sustainable building, you know, when we think about air quality and in indoor air quality, those issues really come together. But sometimes there's just a little bit, you know, sometimes things align. And I think for, for me, I think as I noted in my opening remarks, the two the two game changers was one is in terms of really recognising the ability for us to link this to the electrification pathways because it should have been linked. And so we've already made that decision. So it wasn't quite as brave a decision because we'd already made a really brave decision. And I think also taking the opportunity of the fantastic work that happens outside of government, whether it be the incredible advocates that we have that have been working for decades or, you know, a particular intervention such as the Commissioner's Report. Sometimes, you know, an overnight success comes from the decades of work that's come before it. Um, the, you know, the fact that people actually had been thinking about air quality because of the disasters that we we've been thinking about through COVID as well as the bushfires. So lots of science, lots of, um, uh, lots of art and a whole lot of luck. <laughs> Absolutely. A question down the back here. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name's Terry Slevin. I'm with the Public Health Association of Australia. I'm based here in Canberra. My office is five minutes from that building and five minutes from the Health Department building in Woden. Um, Rebecca, my question is primarily aimed at you, and I ask it very much in consciousness of uh, the Chief Health Officer of the ACT being in the room, uh, Karen. Um, and the question is about trying to take some of the luck out of the process. The thing I've observed in my role, I've been in the role for five years, is in terms of investment in health in Australia, decisions that are made up at that building and the one in Woden, there are clear pathways when it comes to funding for pharmaceuticals, for example, pharmaceutical benefits. Advisory committee makes assessment for funding through pharmaceutical benefits scheme. 
clear pot, clear pathway, clear criteria being set, effectiveness, cost effectiveness. We've got health technology advisories, uh, bodies making assessments about health technology, um, the Medical Services Advisory Committee, etc. There is no equivalent pipeline or pathway to assess public health interventions. And I'm very struck by this very effective one pager, you know, both sides making the case for air quality vitally important. But I've got in my folder one exactly the same on obesity. I've got one in my folder exactly the same on alcohol. And yet there's no pathway for those to be assessed by scientists, as exists with pharmacy and pharmaceutical products and other ways in which we invest in health. For those unfamiliar with the big picture numbers in Australia, uh, uh, AOSW numbers, most recent health expenditure, 221 billion on health. And of that, about 8 billion on public health all told, about 14 billion on pharmaceutical products, but growing at a much faster rate because there's a clear mechanism. So, Rebecca, the question for you is is taking some of the luck out of the process, whether a particular minister's partner gets a disease or whether a particular invention occurs in Australia, let's look at HPV vaccines. Can we take some of that luck out of the process? The constant need for us to make these campaigns, lobbying processes, who knows who, who gets access to what minister, etc. Can we put a bit more system and process into the way in which those funding allocations are made? Yeah, look, it's a great question. I think particularly when we look at some of the big, you know, um, investments, particularly on, you know, medical stuff, that is something that really does sit um, with the, fe you know, often with the federal government and it really, you know, I think there is a real concern around the fact that often it is about the, it's about who can get access to what and, and what time and I think that is, that is a real issue. You know, we get the, pol you know, we elect the politicians that, that, you know, we deserve at some level and so I think it really is around our community really expecting more of our elected officials, really, you know, making the case around evidence base. You know, I, maybe luck's not the right word, but I think it's also around taking the opportunity around things such, you know, um, things that happen and sometimes they're not great things. And, you know, COVID, for public health, COVID's a really good example of that, you know, like, you know, we have had a period where our, pub where our public health officials, our chief medical officers, actually became, you know, became our, you know, our superstars, our yes. everyday, yeah, yeah. You know, I know Tegan, be <laughs> I, my, primarily because, you know, I listened to her every day for, you know, three months when we, you know, when we were just completely in a spin in terms of what was going on. Um, so, you know, like, I think, I think this is an opportunity, particularly for public health, that people actually understand, you know, like people's minds are sharp to the issue of air quality, for instance, in a way that they haven't been for, you know, for probably decades. They probably were in the UK in the 50s um, when they were having, you know, such significant issues. I think one of the challenges for us in public health and preventative health is the reality for elected officials, but also for taxpayers who have to pay it. So we have to do double investment. And that's really difficult. We know that if we invest early in preventative health, in public health, it will actually mean that we will save money in the long term, but there's a period in which we have to double invest. Um, and, you know, as a community, we are, we are pretty reluctant to actually um, put that investment in through increased taxes. So I think, I think there's a lot we need to hold our elected officials accountable, but we need to be having honest conversations as, as well in terms of the investment that we need. You know, they always talk about if, you know, exercise was a pill, you know, they'd be, people would be millionaires, but, you know, we actually haven't, we're not prepared to do the investment to actually support people to take the really simple measures that are actually quite cheap in the end. Is it here? Thank you. Uh, th th thanks for the question, Terry. Just to add, from, from a scientific point of view, a lot of the focus of our work is uh, now shifting to uh, looking at the cost effectiveness of interventions. So traditionally, a lot of the work we did um, in air quality, in climate change, epidemiology was to look at the associations, identify the associations between risk factors and, and health outcomes. Now we are focusing more strongly on, on what works actually to reduce exposure and, and provide cost-effective interventions. And there, there are methods for doing that. Uh, uh, 
some of the evidence which is actually reported in the, in the, in the, in the publication in front of you argues that uh, the return of investment for air quality interventions is, is very clearly, very strongly cost beneficial for every dollar of investment. There is a return of um, much larger, uh, two to ninety dollars of, uh, of benefit in terms of uh, uh, prevented uh, mortality and morbidity. So there is a very strong economic argument and, and a lot of the work we'll be doing as part of SAFER, as part of HEAL and our other networks we're involved in is to identify the most effective intervention, try to monetize the benefit. Which, because we believe that this is clearly something that uh, uh, policymakers can, 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 can use as, as an argument to, uh, to instigate action to, to develop policy. Excellent. A question over here. Um, I'm Ed. I'm a lecturer at the School of Public Health at Sydney, Sydney University. Um, we've talked about uh, the key sources and exposures of air pollution being sort of the main ways of mitigating the health effects and um, Satiris talked about um, susceptibility to exposure by communities who are um, of lower socioeconomic status. Um, one thing I wanted to consider was could we, I mean, when we think about the reduction exposures of these really important um, pollutants which come from our economic activity, social activity, like producing an energy, the way we move ourselves, where we transport, the big, big change that needs to be made to reduce those exposures, really important things that we need to do. What about reducing inequality in our society? And when we think about that, how important is cost effectiveness when what we're trying to achieve is a more equal and healthy and prosperous society with self-determination and capacity to live a fulfilling life? ultimately with public health. So should we be investing more in things like welfare, housing, housing affordability, employment, and education that all stem towards uh, reducing exposure and also reducing those sources as well? Well, what you're making is a critique of the cost effectiveness models of decision making. And, and I would share that critique uh, to some extent. I, I mean, I think I, I, I believe in economics, and I believe you know economics is about how you allocate resources to various. How you is basically the science that helps us to understand how to most effectively allocate resources to achieve desired ends. But I think much of the cost-effectiveness work that's been done in particularly in environmental interventions, and I would actually make the case for the. This is the same in the other area in which I work, which is in tuberculosis elimination, um, is looking at the wrong end point. Because cost effectiveness, it's essentially an equa it's actually a ratio. It's a ratio of the cost and to the effectiveness. <laughs> okay, so what, it really depends on what is your end point that you're measuring the effect effectiveness. If your effectiveness is some sort of proximate endpoint, something that's limited in its scope, then you may find that in fact the, the, the benefits are not, that, are not that great. But if you are looking at much wider range of uh, effectiveness out outcomes, a broader like social, like equality, like social welfare, um, like um, poverty elimination, like better housing, all those sort of things. If your effectiveness is taken much more broadly, then your cost effectiveness equations can be, look very different. So I would just say that I, I don't, I'm not here to throw out economics. I think economics is actually a very important discipline about how to, um, to, to use resources wisely, but I think we can do it better. Um, and we need to think about what are the endpoints that, we're at, that are actually important to us and incorporate those into our cost effectiveness analysis. We are out of time, so please join me in thanking our incredibly brilliant panel.